Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 204, featuring the first installment of my interview with Mr. Bill Volk. Now, Bill is the co-founder and CCO of PlayScreen, but his uh, roots go all the way back to the late 70s, early 80s. Avalon Hill, he's worked for Activision, Return, uh, Return to Zork, and uh, much, much more. In this uh, first part of the interview, we focus in on what he's doing now, his thoughts on the OUYA and the upcoming uh, generation of consoles, the various app stores and all the stuff going on with that market. A lot of great stuff. So without further ado, here is Mr. Bill Volk. All right, folks, I am here with the great Bill Volk, the chief creative officer of PlayScreen. Yeah. Uh, this gentleman has roots that go all the way back to the very early 80s, maybe even late 70s in the, in the games industry. He's worked with Avalon Hill and, and much, much more. Bill, how are you doing today? Good. I'm doing good. You said you're there at a coffee shop there. What's... Yeah, well, I'm traveling today, so here I am at a coffee shop. Uh, what's some of the latest projects you're working on? I was on the website earlier and I saw something about a, a charity gig with Alec Baldwin. Yeah, that was Word Carnival, which is a uh, word search game we did for the iPhone, where the difference between it and other games is that the letters are on balloons, so when you find a word, you swipe a word, uh, the letters pop and new ones come in. So it's sort of like Tetris meets um, Ruzzle, in a way, because the word board is always changing. And because of that, it's actually cool because people can't cheat. They can't freeze the game and look up all the words because the boards are always changing. So we did a challenge to Alec Baldwin, charity challenge, saying, hey, if you can beat this score, we'll give $10,000 to your favorite charity. But uh, what we're working on right now is really interesting. I can't say much about it other than the fact that it's a, a game for the, for the UK only, for Europe only, and it's a real money game where real money is being played in the game, real cash. Why is that so. UK only, because you can't get a license to do that in the United States. It's against the rules in the United States. Hmm. So in, in the UK, you can do casino games with real money on phones. You can't do that anywhere else, really. Well, not, well there's other places, but not in the United States. Not allowed. And uh, it's a very attractive-looking game, but that won't be out for about a month. Very interesting stuff because I'm not doing any of the programming at all on this, but I'm basically doing the promotion and creative uh, promotion on this, and it's just beautiful. I love the little, uh, the little mascot for play screen. Does he have a name? Uh, is he available as Iclops, a plush toy? Iclops. Yeah. yeah, we actually did build a... I have a 3D printed version of Iclops, and he actually is in the new wow. casino game. There's an actual theme with him all over it. And there are games sort of out there in the sort of development pipeline where he plays a major role. <laughs> it's really quite good. Um, and I have no credit. I'll take no credit for that. Uh, there was an artist at the company and, and our CTO, Sherry Kuno, who came up with Iclops. And I have business cards that are actually Iclops business cards, the Iclops business cards. And uh, he uh, this actually turns into a little toy. Come on, come on, come on. It's a Transformer business card. So now he's a little toy that you can stand on the, you know, you can... <laughs> You can uh, put him on a, a table, and he stands. He stands up, and all that. You know, he's uh, there. He is. He's a little toy, and we have like a 3D version of him and a plush toy version. He's a cool icon. I mean, it's funny because like, where's the game with him in it? Well, he shows up in all the games as an intro guy, but he's in the new casino game that's coming out in Europe. He's there's a theme where it's all centered around him. There's a slots game where all the slot characters are different versions of the Iclops. It's really cool. And Does he well, have a British accent, I assume. No, no, it's 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 slots. It's pretty straightforward, but it's you know it's a beautiful game, and in the UK that's really popular. And you know we have we're lucky to have a, a CTO in this company, Sherry Quino, who actually comes from that world and understands it because it's it's a complicated space. I mean, uh, you know, um, the quality level on these iPhone games have to be so high. You know, we have a bunch of apps with four point five star ratings. And um, it's hard to achieve that. And a lot of it is due to the quality of the programming and the art. It's really quite nice. Word Carnival is beautiful. The poker title is beautiful. Our poker game. Um, Crickler is interesting. It's, a, it's sort of a unique type game and all that. Um, but, you know, the thing is, things have, the two things that are most interesting about the game industry is so much has changed and yet so much remains the same. The gameplay issues and the sort of gameplay that people like really is has been established over many years and hasn't really changed that much. But the actual graphics capability, I mean, 
you look at a game like um, the last Naughty Dogs: The Last of Us on the PlayStation Three. That that's unbelievable to me. I, I look at that game being played, and I'm like, this is ins this is like everything everyone thought could happen in a game. So things have evolved. Yeah. You Voyager know, One. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I had Jeff Tunnell on last time, and he talked a lot about the App Store, but he wasn't very fond of it. He's actually. His argument was that there's uh, just a tiny minority of the games that get big and almost everything else just gets totally yeah, ignored, uh, yeah. regardless yes. of how good it is. I mean, would you agree with that assessment? It's absolutely true. And I think here's what's going to... And if you look at the interview I give with uh, 148 apps on the fifth anniversary of the App Store, it's clear to me that the trend is going to be you're going to have to either be incredibly lucky, which some apps are, or you're going to have to have a brand associated with your app. You know, you're going to have something that people will recognize and they'll go of it. Um, or you're going to be going with publishers who have successful apps. So if a publisher has 10 million players on the iPhone or the Android phone playing their games, they can effectively introduce a new game by simply introducing it to their existing users. I call that a channel. And one might say, well, you could go advertise, right? Well, here's the problem with that. You go out and advertise, and maybe you can buy a download for a buck fifty, a legitimate download, not a download this and get some currency, but a real download, an ad. The problem is only some of those users will convert into players. The other side of this is freemium, the sort of free-to-play model where the game is free, but they're in-app items or things like levels, digital objects and stuff, is a really difficult, difficult thing to manage. So yeah, I mean... Here's a statistic. Um, I think 0.5% of all apps on the App Store make 50% of the revenue. So that's a pretty amazing statistic right there. Yeah, so, but you know what? In any open market, and this is an open market which didn't exist before, you will find that the curve, the, the power curve of what sells is very steep. Music is an example of that. There are a lot of people and a lot of bands creating music, but most of the sales are tied to a few major hits every year. And the small bands don't really get much hits. It's very hard to break in. So prior to the App Store, we had markets for games that were much more constrained. On the um, in PC and the Mac, you needed the resources of a developer, of a big publisher, to actually get stuff out. Then we start seeing independent platforms like Steam is a good example, uh, Xbox Live Arcade, and now of course the app stores. And those are open to anyone. There's really no barrier to entry. So uh, it's good and it's bad. It's a two-edged sword. You get guys like the guy who did Tiny Wings. Tiny Wings is a gorgeous, simple, simple, beautiful game on the iPhone. He, they came out of nowhere. They did Tiny Wings and it's a huge success. Angry Birds. Rovio did 52 games that failed before they did Angry Birds. 52. Maybe that's the number. Um, but you also have brands. I mean, um, uh, I, I talk to uh, a lot of venture game people, and there's been a really good reception for venture games now, which glands my heart since I work so hard on adventure games. On the iPhone, there's the, the, uh, the Walking Dead, which of course has a nice brand to it. Uh, there's the Silent Error, which is a sort of in the quirky little game. Uh, Lisa Suit Larry Rebooted is coming out. And it's already a big success on the PC and the Mac. It's a beautiful game. I actually got to play the Mac version a lot. And it's, 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 it's the original game and much better. Um, so those are coming back and those are branded games and they're premium games. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you basically have people who managed to hit uh, success on the iPhone and it's extremely hard to do so. I mean, very hard. So Tunnel's right. Uh, the App Store is a mixed bag. You know, this Play Screen does games not just for the, the iPhone, but Android, Facebook, the uh, web well, we, browser games. I just wonder what you think of the how, how those markets are related or how are they different from each yeah. other. Yeah, it's interesting. Android is a much larger base of users, but revenue-wise, it isn't as good because the payment systems aren't as accepted. So most of the Android apps that are succeeding are now advertising-supported apps. Um, but it's a big market, and one of the good, th one of the weird things, though, <laughs> this is weird. You can't. Google has much less rigorous approval process, and for some people, that's important. Um, 
one cannot do a political game on the iPhone generally. Apple's not going to approve a game that's trying to send a political message. They've made it very clear. Um, one can do that on Google. But as a really weird twist, particularly it relates to our efforts, you cannot do a real money gambling app on Google, on Android, even if it's allowed in the country you're releasing in, but you can do that on an iPhone. So that's an exception. Generally, that's that. So Apple's richer in terms of making money on the apps because every app has everyone's credit cards. Every, Apple has 95% of their users' credit card information, so it's easy for them to do support in-app purchases and all that, harder on Google. Now, the web-based stuff, we have a lot of web-based games. Most of that happened at the prior company that was whose assets were purchased by PlayScreen in 2010. We had a company called um, MyNumo. We had a slew of web-based apps for the iPhone before there was an app store. In fact, Sherry Kuno and myself, when we were at this company called MyNumo, did the very first iPhone game. What happened was the iPhone came out, and that weekend, we released something on the web called iWAC, uh, I, you know, <laughs> which is uh, basically a, a whack-a-mole game featuring Steve Bomber of Microsoft popping out of holes. And you just tap them. And it still works. It works fine on the iPhone. It works fine on the web. So for a year, we did these web-based games, and, and I'm also, I talk about that a little bit in the uh, 148 app interview. And uh, we did things like Blackjack, we had a slots game, we had um, Backgammon, we had a bowling game, we had uh, a ripoff of Frogger called Carmadillo, you know, all sorts of cute web-based games, and they actually made money back in the day, but when the app store happened, everything switched to apps. So... Um, yeah, I don't think the game industry is in a really happy place in many ways right now. You have to think of it this way. You have new consoles, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Wii U, which are not going to necessarily get the uptake that the old consoles did. It's not going to be like when the PlayStation 3 was released. Uh, the economy is different, and, and the reception to Xbox One has been lukewarm and so on, though I think the PlayStation 4 is probably really nice. You have the mobile app markets, Android and iPhone, which are extraordinarily crowded. My statistic, I love the quote, is that during the Nintendo NES era or Famicom era, there were 785 different games ever released in North America. That's it. There are that many games released on the iPhone every week. So it's extraordinarily crowded. And as Jeff is right, you can have a great game and never get noticed. It's, there's real art to making games get noticed. We have one game we shipped in uh, 2011 called Bocce, Bocce Ball. Now it's called Bocce with Friends. We wow. had very low expectations for this game. This was a sort of a carryover project. What we tried to do there is very simple. We tried to build a Bocce game that felt like paper toss. We wanted the interface to be this swipe interface of throwing the ball like paper toss because we didn't see that in the other Bocce games. It was a, a low-budget title, and it did really well. Who would have known? We didn't put any real effort into promoting it beforehand we just released it it got to number one in italy by itself it got to number six in the united states of a little bit of help um you know it's an interesting game um with our poker game we, we've had the highest rated by users poker game on the iphone but getting people to play the game is difficult so we're going to do some things related to theme in that game to make it more popular finding a good theme for it that actually relates to a brand that people care about um so yeah Jeff is right, it's very hard, but what is, else is there? The console world is now dominated by a few players with budgets. I, I can't imagine that the, the Last of Us costs much less than $100 million to put together. It's an extraordinarily rich game, and I'm sure Activision is pumping cash into the next Call of Duty franchise. That's a hard place to compete. So for most game publishers and developers, they're going to compete in the mobile space, and then there's Facebook. Well... Facebook games are kind of a sad story in that for a while there was the hot new trend. But what happened was users got really annoyed at all the messages from the games. Hey, your friend just found a stray cow. Whoop. <laughs> so Facebook put the kibosh on that. And when they did that, it turned something that was very easy to promote. Because the way it used to work is you put out a Facebook game, your users started playing the game, everyone found out about the game because everyone saw all these messages about the game. And... Zynga, for example, built their entire company on that rapid viral growth. Well, a couple, year, a couple years ago, Facebook turned that off, and now everyone is suffering on the Facebook side 
it's much more expensive than even the mobile side to get noticed. So there you go. Um, and Zynga, of course, is in a little bit of trouble because of that. Um, they just hired the former head of the uh, Xbox One project EA executive to be the, the CEO of Zynga. They've replaced Pincus as the CEO because they have to do something. In fact, the game industry right now, there's a series of major problems. I mean, EA has all these social game companies they purchase, haven't really performed as well as they expected. Um, Zynga, you know, is not meeting expectations. The, the companies that are doing really well, appear to me, is Activision because, like him or not, Bobby Kotick, the chairman CEO of Activision, is a business person who understands the game business. <laughs> this pisses people off, but he's, he's got a good point. He's, he's focused on what works for them, and he's not getting distracted. So Bobby will probably continue to do well. Um, I'm, I am the only executive at Activision who was not, who was retained by Bobby when he took over Activision in 1991. And I give him credit for giving us the, uh, the ability to launch Return to Zork. It was Bobby who basically let us do it. And we had a failure right before it. So never got us to the Phobos 2, which was an absolute failure. And Bobby basically let us do it and let us do it without, with, with really very few creative constraints. Eddie Dumbrower, uh, Doug Barnett, myself, and other people, we were allowed to do crazy things, and we did a really good job, and it was a big success for Activision. That's probably the title I am most known for. I have had people at game conferences buy me drinks with the uh, phrase, want some rye, at, at bars. It is very funny to see that happen uh, 20 years later, and also to have people post YouTube videos about the game 20 years later. So... That was a real success, and, and it only happened because Bobby basically believed that we could make it happen. So I was not let go at Activision, uh, and when we moved down to Southern California from Northern California in 1992, we were down to about um, 13 people. So it's a pretty interesting story. Yeah. Well, before we get to the history, I wanted to get your thoughts on the... The Ouya console, if you've been tracking that. Oh, I, I've played it. I'm like one of the few people actually have hand time on it. It's an interesting thing because here's the negatives and here's the positive. The negative it is, it's not that powerful. It's an older Snapdragon processor, blah, blah, blah. It's about like a, a one-year-old or year-and-a-half-old Android phone in power. That's true. But here's what's good about it. The controller actually feels nice. The box is cheap. It can run a bunch of retro games. There's a lot of developers with a lot of Android titles, including us, that you know may do stuff with it, and some developers have already jumped in. For example, I'm friends with um, Chris, has, I'm trying to figure his name, Handy Games. Let me just look his name up so I don't screw it up. Christopher Kazuluki from Germany runs a company called Handy Games, and Handy Games has jumped onto the Ouya in a big way. And I actually, there's a picture of me playing the Ouya on Facebook, and the, I'm smiling because I'm playing one of his games, which is called Save the Puppies. So what he did is he took an Android game that he had, and he adapted it for the controller brilliantly. And, for example, a game like Tiny Wings or uh, others, which are one-button games like Cannibal. Cannibal is a perfect example. They run great on the Oya. Oh yeah. So it's a $99 console, and if they get the App Store working well, and if they fix their glitches, it could have a nice place as a low-cost sort of fun retro machine. The, you know, it, it's, it's not bad. On the other hand, Google's going to do a console. Google said they're going to do a console. And at that point, what happens to Ouya? So it'll be interesting to watch. And finally, Apple has shown in their new developer and stuff, controllers, Bluetooth controllers that look like nice game controllers. That means that Apple's probably going to do something, though it might not be what people think it will be. I also have a chance to use Google Glasses, and either that's going to be a miserable failure or it's going to be very interesting. It's either the Newton or something <laughs> else. I mean, it could be like a step in the right direction that down the road something becomes interesting, or maybe people will pick up on it. And in terms of games, I'm sorry, but the only game I can think of for that device is a sort of real-world augmented reality shooter. And there is precedence for this because in 2003 or 4 in Europe, 
someone did a game called Bot Fighters, B-O-T Fighters. And Bot Fighters was done strictly through text messaging because in Europe, unlike the United States, text messages when they were sent had information about cell tower information. So they were able on their servers to know where players were when they sent the text message. So they would charge you per message and you would send a message and you'd get a list of the targets in your area and you'd decide who to shoot. So shoot first or, or die, right? And they made it a success. There was a success in Moscow, there was a success in Scandinavia. And then later on, there was a game called Gunslingers in Singapore, which was more graphical with maps using GPS smartphones around the 2006, 2007 era. So I could see people doing a, it's like that Microsoft Xbox commercial that only ran once. The one that takes place in Grand Central Station where people are doing finger shooting at each other. Have you ever seen that commercial? It's like that. You could do that with the uh, Google Glasses. So that could be interesting. But it's a niche product. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. Bill Volk. A lot of great stuff coming up, including his time at Avalon Hill. Great, great stuff there, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated and supported the show in any way. Uh, you can do a, a financial contribution by going to armchairarcade.com. Look for the Matt Chat link. You can set up a dollar a week or dollar a month subscription. That doesn't sound like much, guys, but it really, really helps, and I greatly appreciate it. So thank you very much to everyone who's uh, supported the show that way. Um, also appreciate it if you guys post about the show on Twitter, uh, Facebook, your blog, uh, internet forums, or whatever. I, I see those, and I'm really appreciative when I, uh, when I do. So thank you for that as well. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, I don't really... I can't describe this as an ale, <laughs> but nevertheless, it looks so interesting to me, I just had to try it. It's the Flying Cauldron Butterscotch Beer. Now, this is brewed by the, uh, let's see, what's the name of this company? I think it's Reed's, uh, yeah, Reed's Ginger Brew, uh, Reed's Ginger Brew .com. I guess they do mostly ginger uh, beer, which is also uh, something I enjoy. Uh, but this one has sort of a fantasy theme. We've got a, a cauldron here. The little four packet came in, had some fun little recipes. Supposedly this will boost your magic potential. Uh, so what the heck. It's 100% uh, natural, uh, whatever that is. Uh, sh sugar, <laughs> vanilla extract, and something called stevia leaf extract. Okay. No idea what the heck that is. But anyway, let's get this open and, and see if it's any good. All right, so I got some of this flying cauldron butterscotch beer here in the Rather excellent drinking horn. I gotta say, you definitely smell the butterscotch, which I guess is a good sign. Actually, it smells kind of like a cream soda with a bit of a butterscotch uh, topping or flavoring on it. Very, very sweet, uh, which is uh, hardly surprising considering the first ingredient is cane sugar. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Man, is that, this would be so, uh, the perfect beverage for like a, like a summer outing. Uh, if it's hot outside, you know, going to the park or a little carnival. Uh, very sweet, but you get that sort of buttery taste that's uh, unusual. Oh. Okay. I could definitely see chugging a great <laughs> vast quantity of this, which would probably not be advisable considering it's actually quite expensive. Actually, uh... Uh, more expensive than a lot of beer out there, a lot of ale, but anyway, it's uh, definitely quite tasty if you uh, don't want to go for an alcoholic beverage or you got some kids that would like to join in on the on the drinking fun. <laughs> I highly recommend this. Uh, definitely tasty. Um, not nearly as sort of acidic as a uh, Coke uh, would be or Dr. Pepper or something like that. Anyway, uh, I don't know how to rank this uh, non-alcoholic beer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll give it a, a four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, quite tasty, delicious. Uh, yeah, I think you'll definitely enjoy it, uh, but it's not beer, so uh, what, what can you say? Anyway, uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, I got a great quotation here from the actress comedian Lily Tomlin. And it goes something like this. I always wanted to be somebody, but now I realize I should have been more specific. See you guys next week. Ambassador Spock, may I ask a personal question? 
Please. As you examine your life, do you find you have missed your humanity? I have no regrets. No regrets? That is a human expression. Yes. Fascinating. 